So my name is Mickey, and I work at a place called Maya. Uh, it's a research and development lab and a pervasive computing consultancy that spun out of Carnegie Mellon about 25 years ago. Um, Maya stands for most advanced yet acceptable. That's what we focus on, the most advanced technologies, but making them acceptable for normal people. So not making them acceptable for you, normal people. That's who we're trying to make them acceptable for. And, if, and to get a sense of uh, our lab, this is what it looks like. Um, we try to get a lot of different kinds of people together. We basically do R&D as a service. So we're Skunk Works, Skunk Works. And we basically help people, and you probably have never heard of us, and that's probably good or else we'd get in trouble. Um, but we wanted to tell you about something that we could talk about, um, and so I'll be exploring kind of a behind-the-scenes project we just finished. The way that we work is we get together people that understand people, like cognitive psychologists and anthropologists and ethnographers. We get together people that understand how things work, makers and engineers and mathematicians and electrical engineers and such. And then we get together designers. I'm an industrial designer. We have industrial designers, filmmakers, uh, brick and mortar architects, game designers, et cetera. People who understand form and function and, and, and how to kind of get people together to create. Ultimately, our mission is to tame complexity so people feel powerful, so that it feels like you can reach further, so you can reach the stars, reach the moon, and feel that you're empowered with it, not, not sort of feeling like you're being turned into some sort of servant of all this technology. Throughout the entire process of Maya, um, we've always focused on three deep things. One of them is putting people first. It's sort of forget technology. We can make anything. We can make it right. It's time to focus on making the right thing. And we've really entered that era, and that's what we like focusing on. The second one is an architectural approach. That means that stepping back and kind of looking to see what are the patterns that are resilient so that we can actually build things that last instead of stunts. And the third one is the connected world. A lot of people talk about pervasive computing or the Internet of Things or whatever, um, and that's really a, a big focus. And in fact, I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. I'm one of the authors of a book called Trillions. This is my product placement right here. <laughs> Skyler says buy the book. Um, so uh, I actually have a few copies. If you can figure out the secret code by the end of the, of the talk and maybe follow me on Twitter, I'm not telling you the code, I've got 12 copies. So while they last, I'll, I'll give you a signed copy at the end. Um, so uh, one of the things we never really talked about was what we were doing in our labs. So this is the first time we pulled back the curtain and we actually explored what we've been exploring and talking about and researching for 25 years. So Trillions is really our first comprehensive report into the next information revolution. This is the one that's actually the real deal, the one that's coming in the next five years. And we think of it as a sort of field guide to the, to the future of connected complexity and connected things, the sort of the world of us living in the information. There are a whole bunch of stops along the way, and I'm not really going to belabor it. If you're interested, get the book. Um, the old mountain over there is like a few billion computers. Everybody's got cell phones in their pocket. I think last year we had about seven billion supercomputers in our pocket. That's great. We got to the top of a mountain, and anybody who's ever climbed a mountain realizes sometimes you find a bigger mountain on the other side. And that's trillions. And most analysts think we're going to hit trillions of computing devices in the next five years. So that's kind of, kind of overwhelming. It turns out we've already made 10 billion microprocessors alone in 2010, and we now make more transistors than grains of rice, and we make them cheaper. So that's already happening. This is a done deal. And the, the question is, what happens when instead of looking down into a computer or a phone and seeing your stuff, you're in the computer, you're in the information. So it's really like turning the sock inside out. Instead of information in computers, it's us living in the information. And I think that's the big deal. And the deal is, it's not just a trillion things that are all the same. It's a trillion things sending a billion messages. It's a trillion things getting a bad update, turning into bricks. Uh, there recently were LG refrigerators that were shipped around the world that started turning into spam bots. And so they're on the market in your homes, and they're sending out denial of service attacks on people. So it's, so it's an interesting space, and we have to kind of think about what it means that we can not only uh, survive it, but how do we thrive in that space? And I think if you're a business person or if you're worried about kind of how do we make sure that we're having a rich culture, think about it. That mountain over there that we just climbed, the internet revolution that everyone's excited about, we're climbing and we're at the very top. MySpace has to die for Facebook to win. We're fighting over the last few inches of the web and, and, and the traditional ways of doing things that we invented in the 1970s. But over there, there's a lot of surface area. Anything multiplied by a trillion is a really interesting number, well, except for zero. A lot of things are interesting. So, um, so we have a prediction. We think, we think the maker world, the maker movement combined with the internet of everything is actually going to be the phase-changing moment. We think everything's going to change. From, 
from how we make things to how we experience them, and also even how we manufacture things so we can reduce the amount of waste in the world. We think this is going to really move towards an ecology. When you get that big, it's an ecology. Your body, everybody in this entire audience has about 150 to 100 trillion cells, right? So one hand of your body actually puts the internet to shame. So nature's figured a lot of this out. A lot of our research is into biomimicry for information systems. So I'd like to talk a little bit about how makers meet the Internet of Things, meet manufacturing, and really change the, change the game. So we have a prediction. If the last mountain was mostly about getting everyone connected on the social network and about bits and about all that kind of stuff and helping people join, we think the next one is about products joining the social network and maybe factories joining the social network and our world joining the social network. You know, your shoe is basically going to say, I'm a wonderful shoe, and your sock is going to say, eh, not so much. It's kind of staining my socks. So everything is going to start forming its own social network. And we think that's actually going to affect things when atoms converge with bits and become much more facile. And so that's what we want to talk about. When factories join the social network, so instead of making millions of things and then hoping we can get people to buy them and getting them to like it, what happens when we flip the picture and we, have, we help people make the things they like instead of us trying to get them to like the things we made? We think there's a fundamental flip that's going to happen. So if you understand the way business works, and I'm going, to, I'm going to do this for about a minute, and then we're going to go into a fun little case study and show you behind the scenes ways that we failed a lot and then succeeded a little. So there are the marketing guys. They were totally blown away by the social media revolution. They learned a whole bunch. And in big organizations, they, they basically uh, had a huge inbox that was filling up with all sorts of information. People told them by Amazon reviews whether they liked the product. They had a really quick feedback loop. So marketers learned a lot about how to engage customers, how to play with communities. You know, we had Twitter and Facebook and the rest blew up. But marketers are only one side of the equation. Research and development is the other side. Last year, the top 20 research and development, actually the top 20 companies in the world, only spent about maybe $300 billion, that sounds like a lot, um, on, on research and development, on inventing new things. But they spent over a trillion dollars on trying to get you to like the stuff they made already. Right? And so what if we were to flip that picture and actually focus on reinventing things? And these guys don't talk to each other. You know, their own silos, their own tribes. And it's, in fact, it's important because they're making real things. They're building houses. They're building food that's safe to eat. Atoms are hard. And that's one of the things you guys are all learning in the maker movement. Atoms are hard. Um, and it's not so trivial to actually get them to work and be safe, and they cost money, and they're complicated, and you've got to recycle them. So what will product development look like? And what, how can we get these guys to actually play together? and play together in a way that's actually virtuous, and play with us, the makers of the world? Could we use open innovation to actually change the culture in these companies? Because they're helping us do things. You know, cookies are being out, sent out there in the world, and we're lowering calorie prices dramatically, but they're not necessarily good calories. How do we actually start playing in a way that it makes sense? So we decided to do a, an experiment. We took one industry, um, actually a love, indus a love brand. It's called Oreo. How many people like Oreo cookies? Anybody here? Ever had an Oreo? You twist, you lick the outside first, I don't know. So, so people have that. So we said, what happens if we took Oreos and joined them to a giant social network and played around with it? Could we get these guys to play together nicely? And could we get them to play together nicely really fast? Could we simulate a year and a week? And could we have fun? Could we do it as a giant art installation and just have a good time? Could we put the whole idea into a Petri dish? So let's test the theory. And now, now I'll show the actually kind of interesting stuff. So let's take Twitter, team it up with Oreo, and find out what happens when you can eat the tweet. That's horrible, sorry. OK. <laughs> so the way we started back in maybe um, the spring was we got four days together with a whole bunch of people. We met with 14 partners from the biggest movie companies in the world to the smallest makers. We looked at 500 plus PowerPoint slides. And over four days, we just started covering the walls. We had people that were food scientists, engineers, factory, factory guys building new factories. We had marketers. We had business people. Um, we, had, we had a lot of different stuff. And we talked about sort of the sticky issues and the beautiful buds that could that come, come out of this. Here's an example of some pictures. One idea that came out was the idea of sort of trending now. Could you actually make the food the moment it's trending? Another idea was, could we team up with like Transformers with Mark Wahlberg? It's coming out any minute. And not do something you know, totally upstairs, like just put up a big you know, commercial. Could we have like a little robot that pops out of a, a box of cookies and goes ahead and like shoves the cookies back in its belly when nobody's looking, drinks all the milk, and falls back over again when the guys turn the lights back on in the kitchen? Or could it be a vending machine that vends something to Mark Wahlberg's kid, and when he, 
When he pulls the thing out, it says it's you know, Bobby's cookies, and they were made just for him, and they've got hashtags carved inside the cookie. And he goes and runs up and says to his dad, look at the cookies, and by the time they turn back, the vending machine has gotten up as a transformer and run away. So we were just goofing around. These are silly ideas. One of, this, one of the product innovators actually had something cool. They called it fortune cookie. And the idea was when you licked away the icing, you could actually see hashtags. And you could have stories, and you could maybe even have Vine still frames, so that if you put together enough cookies, you could do stop motion animation and silly things like that. Like, could we hide messaging inside the cookies? So we started looking at how you encounter the, the cookie, how you explore the different flavors, how do you buy it, how do you experience, how do you share it, how do we grow this community? And one of them came out with that, was that vending machine and pop-up store. And we started thinking about what if you could have a new recipe for the cookie every day? What if you could actually tie it to trending? What if like Jay-Z is trending and we make a cookie that tastes like Jay-Z? I don't know what that is. We actually ended up discovering what that meant. So then we said, let's make a vending machine. Let's call it Trending Now, Vending Now. So, so this was sort of the idea. What if um, on college campuses, the day before the, the Red Wedding episode of uh, Game of Thrones, you started knocking out red velvet Oreo cookies for all the college kids. That's horrible, sorry. Very spooky, blood red cookies. Um, then we said, let's prototype it. So we prototyped it in about 24 hours with a little video. So this is totally fake, but it's 24 hours. I'll apologize now. Somebody said, what about 3D printing? Could we 3D print the cookies? <laughs> Could we put a little CNC machine in the cookie and mill out those hashtags? We did try other things. But this was the first 24 hours. And what I'm trying to show you, too, is rapidly prototyping. It went from a sketch to a little movie in 24 hours. Now you have your cookies. So that was the kind of idea. Um, and it turns out, inside the organization, nobody wanted to do it. Like they, they were having different kinds of issues with different things, budgets got cut, fortune cookie gets put on the shelf. About four, four months later, they're shopping this thing around, and Twitter's like, we would love to play with that, and we want to put some money in too. And so Oreo and Twitter started thinking about how they could do things, and they said, what if we go to South by Southwest? It's a big kind of music interactive fest, and did like a food truck. And the food truck would like leave cookie crumbs behind that made out of chalk, and you'd be able to find it that way and you'd be able to walk up to it, and we'd actually have a test kitchen in the back, because we didn't think we could actually make this so fast, so we'd fake it. We'd, we'd actually have people back, like, moving robot arms to actually fake it all. It's called Wizard of Oz prototyping. You're sort of the wizard behind the curtain, faking things. And so we said, yeah, we'll do that. We'll have an internal uh, kitchen. Um, and then um, it turns out it took a long time to get approvals on it, so then we only had six weeks. So January 15th or so, we heard, yes, go ahead and do this. You have to make two nano factories, you have to put it in front of 30,000 of the snarkiest people on the planet in Austin, Texas, have fun. And so that's when I called Steve Spencer, who's actually one of our senior designers and inventors. Is Steve in the audience here? Steve Spencer's right there. If you really want to know how it works, Steve Spencer. <laughs> Foolishly, he said yes. He said yes, he would. So the time is now ticking. He has six weeks to figure out how to do something that is approved by Oreo food scientists and safety that won't hurt people, that tastes like cookies, and make a 3D printer that can support 30,000 people. Let's go. So, so we're zoomed in on you turn the volume up a little? standard size uh, vending machine mock-up. And this right here is the screen. I can't reach into it because we have a clear LCD panel with a multi-touch screen. This is where we're going to have the whole user interface for making your selections and assembling your Oreo. And once you're done making your selections or as you make your selections, the uh, machine that you can see through the LCD panel will put out your first cookie. So he's here. actually prototyping. And then it'll progress paper. to uh, get your flavoring. So you might get one flavor here keep going and if you selected multiple flavors you might get your next flavor here going through and then it comes over here to get your 
top wafer which comes down and goes on and it'll go through a roller or something to get pressed together you be able and then to it. it'll come through and it'll slide down to get automatically packaged and vended to you. First prototype, Steve. <laughs> All right, so that was done at lunchtime with toilet paper rolls and paper. But it started to, to form an idea. So then we said, oh my god, you know, doing a CNC mill to actually cut out hashtags, that might be tough. It might break the cookies. The cookies, we don't even know what the consistency is. Could we use a laser cutter? So immediately, we sent something off to a laser cutter. Guys, the laser lab down the street, and we said, let's try this with the cookies. We are like, look at this, I think it might actually work. If you put icing on it, can you lick it away and actually see the, you know, the white icing stuck inside the crannies? We don't know, maybe so. We're like waiting, we're waiting for this. We're seeing what's gonna happen. Let's pick it up. It's in there, Maya. And we tested it, and the icing actually did stick in there, and then when you bit into it, it tasted horrible. It was like a burned, horrible, it was like the opposite of an Oreo cookie. It was whatever is the competitor of an Oreo cookie. Okay, so then, Steven and team start modeling it up in computers. So now we've got, you know, we're, we're catting it up, we're trying to figure out what's happening, and we decide to make a food safe version so we can actually start putting in some stuff and not kill the designers while we're testing. And then we start building, we order some Samsung displays from, from their secret labs in Korea. There are only like 20 of these in the world. High def displays that you can actually make totally opaque or totally transparent. And we decide to make them hyper multi-touch and actually we prototype it. So we call up Oreo and we say, can we slide this in? Can we bring it up to your Oreo labs? And so we show up, most agencies show up with like PowerPoint slides. We showed up with a vending machine that we had built overnight. So Steve built this over the weekend with two or three other guys. We slide it in and we start brainstorming. We put a giant food truck out of paper on the side and we start thinking about it. That's Jen, who's actually the global head of Oreo. And she's the one who, who was working on the original fortune cookie idea that got shelled because of budgeting. So she's getting excited and we're talking about how do people experience it and how do they exit it. And then we have another prototype. So let's take a look at this one. Can you turn the volume up on that? Could potentially come in here and go like yeah, region, yeah, recipe, yeah, chef, yeah, trend. Yeah. It'll be multi-touch. So I'll pick region. Um, now it peek 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 in, and you can actually see the see the machine. You know, so I can do things like vend a cookie, start having it come over. <laughs> no. I'm broken. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dumping it. Stop! No, no. <laughs> We're still back in the back turning knobs. Okay. So then we say, wait a second, if the food truck, nobody can find it, if there's a giant line, if we got like a four hour long line, the food truck's gonna be in trouble. Plus, what happens if it breaks? It would be really nice if we could just have a lounge. You know, maybe we'll have like 12 different flavors of, of uh, milk, because milk is really important. At night, we'll have a DJ and we'll have white Russians. We'll like kind of have fun with it, so that just in case, remember, we just wanna have a good time and learn, and we wanna engage 30,000 people and have them help us think, and help, help, help turn this into something. So we keep working. Now it's time for prototyping. Let's try another prototype. We've got to figure out a way to center the cookie. So we have to make a few different robots that are going to do this. We have to drop the cookie, center the cookie. So this is one of the centering cookie tools. We have to be able to drop one cookie at a time, not drop a bunch, not ruin them. And different cookies have different thicknesses. So we actually have to have it, make sure it's programmable. So this is our attempt, just using some servos, to figure out a way to basically automatically dispense a, a shell, a cookie shell. Trying to think it through, trying to figure that out. Okay, let's see what happens next. We've got a bunch of stuff together. We take a Delta printer. We're like, let's flip the Delta printer upside down. This way we can actually scribble all sorts of crazy stuff. We'll put the centering mechanism on it so we can center. Now we've got a little robot pincher arm for centering. So we're trying to figure this out. Now this is really, now what, what week is it? Steve. Week two. So two weeks. So we have four weeks left. Four weeks left. All right, what's happening? Steve, how long does this video go for? Yeah, we, it's just a lot of people basically... Uh, yeah, it, this video goes for about four weeks. So this is the idea. We're gonna have we're gonna have this thing on there, and we're gonna like have move it around, and we're gonna be able to scribble stuff. So that was that was kind of the next idea. Okay, now what happens? Oh, we've got to extrude stuff. We've got to go order um, surgically safe, super high micron filtered stuff because we can't poison people. And let's try it out. So now we've got like caulk guns, and we've got like medical dispensers, and we're doodling. And we're like, if this doesn't work, we'll just have a bar where people can draw their own cookies. That'll be good. So Steve decides to try to see how fact, maybe we could make it do super triple double stuffs. Steve is the hand model for this one. 
Can we actually stop it from squirting? Can we actually put back pressure so we can make sure that we get exactly what we want and pull back up the stuff so that it doesn't cut up? That's the next step. So Steve, you're getting pretty excited at this point, yes? What did you think? Did you think you could pull this off? Yeah. Breakfast champions. Okay, then we've got to figure out what an actual vending machine looks like. So now we're starting to think about what's a trending vending machine look like. And then we start pulling it all together. We've got a robot arm that's going to move a cup. We've got the other robot that's going to do the delta printing. We've got the robot that's going to rotate 12 to 14 different flavors. And we've got to think that through. Then we've got to be able to dispense it. So let's go ahead and try one. Let's put it all together. Oh, let's put a marker in it. So now we can write secret messages in the bottom. You didn't have to do that. All right, week three. Three weeks left. Three weeks. We've got to get these factories built. Look, it's putting down a cookie. Let's see what happens. It put a cookie in. All right, there's a cookie in the container. Let's go squirt something. Bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. This is going to work so perfectly. It worked perfectly when Steve did it. This should work great. Here we go. Squirt it on there. It's great, except for it won't stick. Atoms are hard. All right. And we can't change the cookies. It has to be Oreo. It has to taste like an Oreo. Let's try again. Let's try a different flavor. Yeah, that is beautiful. Steve, what were you thinking when this was happening? Uh-oh. All right. Maybe, maybe Oreo will be OK with that. It doesn't look so bad. Let's put a cap on it. Let's see if we can dispense an actual cookie. This is the first time we're going to ever do one. Let's try it. We've got to put another one on. Little factory, push it. Oh, it didn't stick. Oh my god, we can't get a, the second shell to stick. We are not having a good time. That's somebody who's not happy. <laughs> All right, so, so concurrently, there are a lot of people steering at computers because we've got to figure out how to actually build algorithms. We've got to figure out how to actually make this happen because we need to convert tweets, trending tweets in the world, into food. So we have to figure that out. Eat the tweet doesn't make any sense to anybody. So, so how would you eat a tweet? We wanted to eat the trending vending. So we actually started figuring out the mental model of, of a person who's going to do this. How do we engage them? How do we play with it? We started thinking through the information architecture. What's going on there? We started thinking about a quantified snack markup language. <laughs> QSML, my friends. All right. And then we started figuring out what are basic patterns. Could we do pie charts so we could actually do data visualization out of different flavors? And then we started playing around. It turns out those, those transparent displays kind of suck. Right? They're, they're, like, you can't really, you're seeing too much. Then we started thinking, let's make it really simple. Just the top 10 trends, click on the trend, go ahead and mix it and, and mash it up and taste it and see what happens. And these are live generated by, by complex algorithms that Twitter helped us with. So here it is. We're all sitting around. We're trying it again. It, now what time is this? Like the night before, I think. Matt, the creative director, says, I saw a YouTube video that lets you get a bottle opened. <laughs> no. No, it doesn't. You can't trust YouTube. Yeah, that's right. All right. How many days until you have to open? Two days. Two days. He's got his shoes covered in wine. He's still in Pittsburgh, where Carnegie Mellon is. And now we've got to get, we've got to make two of them. We've got to get them there. We've got to open them up. We've got to get food permits. We've got to get everything else. Let's have a party. So Sunday night, we have a party because we actually have to test it with real users. And we want them to be nice to us, so we give them alcohol. There's Matt, uh, right, I think, when you guys got to South by Southwest. So you haven't slept yet. But you finally pull it off. Um, and suddenly, people start showing up. Here's the trending vending lounge. So it is two days later. Steve, you've actually gotten there. Yay, team. Steve. All right. Now the only thing is 30,000 people are about to show up. And actually, a bunch of people are going to show up for interactive, 10,000, 20,000. And then when music hits, 50, 60, 70,000. So by by next Tuesday, this is Saturday or Friday, by next Tuesday, it better all be working because the giant mob of people are going to show up with, the, with, with stuff like that. So this is what it started looking like. Super clean interface. We figured out a way to manage the, the, the complications. We recut everything. and We 3D printed and recut everything out of food safe materials so the Delta printer works and everything else works and it's safe. And then suddenly lines started showing up. We had one unit that was actually pre-printing the cookies so you could just watch it cook. And, and the other unit, you could make your own. Look at what the one people wanted. Make your own. OK. This is what it looked like. It turns out we had lines averaging about two hours in the pouring rain and 45 degrees, and then it really got busy later. 
Here's a pan. I don't think I've got audio for this one. Cookie bar. You better be able to dump, dunk and lick and everything. People are excited. All right. South by Southwest Interactive in Austin, Texas. Here we go. We invited festival goers to the Trending Vending Lounge to participate in an experiment. What would happen if your Oreo cookie joins the social network? Our prototype vending machines take what's trending on Twitter and turns those trends into custom Oreos. Using unique transparent touchscreens, users scroll through a list of trending topics, each related to a particular flavor combination and pattern. Advanced algorithms translate the tweets into custom cookies. In all, there are about 10,000 possible combinations. Users can also mash up two trends to further customize the experience. The resulting cookie combines elements of the two original trends. Once the user hits Make Cookie, the now real magic this, happens. Using some repurposed 3D printing technology and a pneumatic pump system, we've enabled festival attendees to watch their custom cookie as it's robotically printed and assembled. cookie has dropped into a cup, vended, and is now ready to enjoy. <laughs> thumbs up? Yes! Thumbs up! I give you Steve Spencer and his team who's floating all over. Nice job! All right, I have three minutes left, three minutes left. So um, it is going crazy back there. The food scientists are back there, and they're actually blending new flavors because there's something trending, and they want to test it out tomorrow. They're starting to come up with ideas. They can test overnight new ideas. They're thinking about what happens if you work out really hard, and your Fitbit says that you're working out really hard. Maybe we could actually give you a little extra sweetness that day. You know, so we can start doing personal trends. We're starting to think, what if you invent something that's better than us? Why don't we make you a millionaire? We'll make Oreo tycoons. We're starting to test that stuff out, so we bring the human scientists in. Kevin Rupert, Nick, who? Kamita, and who's the one? Kiko. Kiko. So Mayans, uh, different kinds of people, people from food safety stuff, freaking out, making new things, basically just having fun, never going to sleep, making amazing food. And then it's so busy, we have to hot swap live. So when the materials are running out, you turn the volume up. Bradley's got to bring it home. That's my Bradley. It. Last hot swap of the Poor night. Yep. Can't stop. We got a line of people. Four hours long right, now because it's, going, it's, going. Uh, it's now. Yeah. yeah. Success. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> All right. Now, what is Steve doing right now? He's out. So how did it work? Did we have fun? Yes. Did we learn a lot? Yes. Actually, one more thing. So people started posting things. We would walk up to people and we'd say, what did you just print? I just printed Daylight Savings Time. It generated it because that Sunday was Daylight Savings Time, so it was a Starburst with lemon and different flavors. And they ate it, they ate it and they were like, it's Daylight Savings Time. <laughs> and their heads were putting it together the same way films put, put, put things together in your head, stories by cross-cutting. We literally did have somebody come up and say, this tastes just like Jay-Z. It does. <laughs> Ellen selfie trended, people loved it. At one point, the vending machine was trending itself, so it was printing a, a, a cookie of itself. Fast Company shows up, they start saying, this is actually the secret way that Oreo, the mother company Mondelez, is actually gonna approach innovation. They're not gonna sit in a room doing a thinkathon with a bunch of executives, they're gonna go out in the world and think by doing, and they're gonna actually make things. And people are there, and they're starting to talk about, okay, Julian Assange is there, he's Skyping in, yes, We've got shoddy internet, and we're tasting crazy combinations of Oreo cookies. The festival has everything we hoped for and nothing we expected. Yay, team. And Make shows up, and they do a behind-the-scenes one. If you want to see behind-the-scenes and find out how Arduinos were used in this, you can actually watch a secret behind-the-scenes video if you go there. What happened? 
let's see, we had about a, a third of all the attendees, that's about a, a, a 10,000, um, about 100 people in line at a time, two hour wait, 45 million media impressions, six million media impressions with online uh, different people, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, um, and it was positive sentiment. People were eating them and it tasted like a cookie and they were saying this is really great. So, so that's as far as we're going to get. I think I'm just about out of time. I want to show you one last bit because coming up in about a month is um, a movie with robots that inspired us at the very beginning of this. And I thought it might be fun for you to actually see um, what's coming. So, uh, yes, check it out. Those are actually molded cookies with transformers inside them. I can't tell you what's going to be in the movie, but what I can tell you is that we did another prototype late at night. And this is a 24-hour prototype using Robotis robots. Turn up the volume. The home edition, my friends. Hold on. It's got to scan your home. Thinking. Looking at your music playlist. Looking at Netflix, it's checking out your Nike fuel points. Now it's going to go back to the lab. It's going to mix up a special flavor just for you. That is not toothpaste. my friends. Thanks, everybody.